My very dear friends, brothers and sisters, I am delighted to be here um, at this important time in the life of our country, soon after the Lok Sabha elections, to attend this session of the EMS Smriti lecture series. My topic today is democracy and dictatorship in India. But before we come to the topic, I would like to pay my homage and tribute to Comrade EMS Nambudripad, the great Marxist revolutionary and thinker who combined in himself and his work a synthesis of revolutionary theory and practice and who used his towering intellect for the cause of the working classes of India, for the cause of socialism. And today, at a time of changing political dynamics, I think it is important also to learn from a very critical area of EMS's work, which was to understand changing social relations in a society where the penetration of capitalism in every sphere of life throws up new challenges in multiple fields even while intensifying exploitation. So in tribute to EMS and to pledge to take his work forward and also on this occasion, I would like to remember and pay tribute to our beloved comrade Datmash and Murli Marsh, who for so many years had taken forward this idea that to celebrate EMS and to celebrate his work, it is so important to have an exchange of ideas, to have discussion, arguments, debate, dissent. That was EMS's life, and Datmash and Murli Marsh paid their tribute through the organization of this EMS Smriti. So I pay my tribute to Datmash and Murli Marsh. We miss them, and I particularly miss them when I come here to Trishur. As I said, um, we are discussing the topic of democracy and dictatorship in India. Now, I did a quick Google search to see what is the kind of common definitions which come up when we talk about democracy and dictatorship. And I found the commonest definition used, whether in textbooks or in papers, is what I thought a rather narrow definition, which is, quote, democracy is described as a system of government which is chosen by the entire population or eligible members of the state through elected representatives. And Dictatorship is defined as a form of government where the single individual or group of people wield power without any limitations to constitutional authority. Now in my mind, and as I will try and argue in the course of this discussion, this concept of democracy and dictatorship is a very narrow concept because it confines us to only one aspect, which is the form of government. So a form of government, according to this understanding, is either democratic or it is dictatorial. But even, even, if we go by this very narrow concept of what constitutes democracy and dictatorship, 
and limit our discussion in the first section to this aspect of a form of governance, what we find and what we see is in the last 10 years of the Modi rule, starting from 2014, what we actually saw was an outright assault even on this so-called democratic form of governance. Now, even if you look at parliament, which is considered as the main model of democratic governance, if you just look at a few statistics, before the Modi years, Parliament used to meet on an average around 100 days a year and earlier the first Parliament met for 135 days a year. But in the Modi years following 214, Parliament itself, which is the seat of parliamentary democracy, the centre of parliamentary democracy, Parliament met on an average between 2019 and 2000 and February 2024, just for an average of 55 days. So this shows how, even within a form of governance which is supposed to be democratic, how the seat of that democracy, Parliament, can be so quickly downgraded. Another aspect in our parliamentary democracy is bipartisan mechanisms. Biparty mechanisms means that any important business of parliament seeks to form a consensus between different representatives of the house. For example, to pass a legislation in our parliamentary democracy there is the mechanism of what is called a standing committee. A standing committee is representatives of all parties. So if a bill is to be introduced, as say for example, the three agricultural bills, those three agricultural bills should have been sent to a standing committee, but during the Modi years, the mechanism of all party discussions was actually demolished. And what we saw is the tyranny of a parliamentary majority. By a tyranny of parliamentary majority, I mean you can have a democratically elected majority, but if that democratically elected majority has its sole purpose of destroying protocols, destroying precedents, you'll be surprised to know that earlier on, before 2014, all bills, in other words, all bills which ultimately became laws, were sent to the Standing Committee for scrutiny, discussion and amendment in 73% cases of bills. During the Modi years, only 13% of all bills were sent to the mechanism of the Standing Committee. The budget. The budget is a very critical document for every single Indian. What happens in discussions on the budget? Earlier, there used to be a full-fledged discussion for the budget. This time, 80% in the last five years of budgetary exercises, 80% of the budgets were passed without any discussion. And in the 2024 budget, it was passed the entire budget was passed without any discussion. So the first point is, even if we look at democracy and the functioning of 
democratic institutions from the narrow definition of forms of governance, we find that there was an outright assault on the center parliamentary democracy, parliament itself. What we also saw during this period were the, uh, uh, the legislation of so many laws which were directed against the Constitution of India, which promoted the centralization of power as opposed to the federal structure of the Constitution, and which, through this process of extreme centralization, a unitary form of government, which is death to democracy. In a country like India, where the Constitution itself recognizes the diversity of peoples, cultures, languages, and therefore gives a special place to state governments in the constitutional structure, what we found both financially and politically, we found a complete downgrading and weakening and dilution of the federal structure of the Constitution, which is a very, very important part and a pillar for democratic functioning in a country like India. And what is interesting to note, and I think this is an example which we see across the world where right-wing um, uh, uh, regimes come through an electoral process, that in the course of centralization of power, what we find is the centralization of power from the states to the center and from the center to an individual. Never before in the history of our country, and certainly it should give thought to BJP members and BJP leaders that even an election manifesto, it is so centralized that the name of the party itself is removed and it comes only in the name of an individual. Now that can be a party's choice. But as far as parliamentary democracy is concerned, the concentration of powers in an individual, the promotion of the cult of the individual, the promotion of the quote-unquote strong man in democratic politics is an anathema to democratic politics. So much so that we saw in the Indian context the supreme leader describing himself as being non-biological and being directly sent by Paramatma. Now, we can make fun of it, but to me it seems symbolic of the drive towards the agenda of one leader, one party, one center. So look at it in that way. It was also in this period, my dear friends, where we saw the worst and the most extreme forms of inequality growing in India. I think you know that today, India has been defined as one of the most unequal societies in the world, where just 1% of the richest Indians own 40% of India's wealth. So these trends which we have seen in the last 10 years, I would describe it as a hollowing out of democratic structures and institutions which were mandated by the Constitution to be autonomous. We have seen the pressures put on the judiciary, we have seen the blatant interference in the appointment of judges. We have seen the unconcealed use of central agencies to hound and arrest opposition leaders, democratic dissenters. And we have seen the unprecedented use of draconian laws. 
My dear friends, during the period of the Modi regime, there has been a 72% increase of arrests under the UAPA. You know what the UAPA is. This is one of the most draconian laws on our statute book. And I think in any debate on democracy and dictatorship, one of the most important demands we must make is the repeal and the scrapping of such draconian laws like UAPA, which were used so liberally by the Modi regime. In this period, 8,947 people were arrested under UAPA. This is a record that we have seen in India. And this is after this terrible amendments moved in 2019 to make UAP even more stringent. You can't get bail under UAP. Charge sheets also may take years to do. In the Bhima Kuregaon case, we have seen where leaders of movements had been arrested. For four years, even the charge sheet was not given, and they were denied bail. And it is only now, after the intervention of the Supreme Court and the Bombay High Court, that some of the arrestees and detainees have got bail. And along with the use of these draconian laws, we also saw laws which changed the very basis of citizenship in India, using religion as the marker to decide whether a person would be given citizenship or not. And all this occurred in an ideological framework. These were not just measures taken by an uh, authoritarian leader. These were measures which were part and are part of an ideological framework which seeks to change the very basis of India's democracy, which in independent India undoubtedly lies in the values which are embedded in the Constitution of India, which makes us a secular democratic republic. And to replace a secular democratic republic with a communal, authoritarian, pro-corporate regime. So this was the entire ideological framework leading, they hoped, to the establishment of a Hindu Rashtra. So now in these years, even with this narrow concept of form of governance, what we see that in the balance between democracy and dictatorship. As I have described briefly, there are so many more examples, but even with this, we can understand that in the balance between democracy and dictatorship, in the last 10 years, the needle has tilted towards dictatorship against democracy, if not entirely shifted. We could clearly see the tilt towards dictatorship from democracy. But when I speak about dictatorship, I am not referring to the classical form of dictatorship as was described by my search and what I have read out to at the outset of this discussion. In India, as in different parts of the world, the victory of right-wing forces have seen the growth of new forms of authoritarianism. 
they are no less vicious than the classical dictatorship but these new forms of assault on democracy function through the deliberate emasculation of democratic institutions not by elimination but by emasculation earlier dictatorships used to eliminate cutch that's done this is an incremental emasculation of everything that is democratic in a constitution or in a system of governance and what we can call in india's concept a uh, context a kind of hybrid dictatorship so it's not a classical form of dictatorship but looking at its forms we can call it a kind of hybrid dictatorship now it is in this context of where india was heading where the tilt was tilting where the shift was shifting that we had the lok sabha elections now yesterday's discussion many of you were present and there was a very detailed discussion about the lok sabha elections so i'm not going into that but only from the point of view of this understanding of democracy in dictatorship and forms of governance we can say that the fast growing tilt towards dictatorship has through the electoral verdict through the will of the people of india suffered a setback one could say a severe setback because the trends moving towards the total emasculation of democracy and who knows perhaps the replacement of many of the institutions because if the goal of 400 plus was to replace the constitution of india we cannot predict what would have happened but what we can say is that the election results have undoubtedly reversed not totally but have proved to be a setback to the tilt towards a stronger hybrid dictatorship and what i would also like to point out in this that of course it is true that the opposition or the india platform or the combination of opposition parties fell short of the majority by 32 seats the bjp as you know lost 63 seats but i think it is not just a question of seats which were lost and although the india platform fell short of a majority i would consider this a moral victory for the people of india and for the opposition parties who represented them a moral victory even though you fell short of a majority by 32 why do i say it's a moral victory because as i have said these elections came at a time when there was no level playing field in parliamentary politics at all i mean forget it what happened with the election commission a constitutionally mandated body to act impartially what was impartial about it from the word go every single action of the election commission was designed to serve the interests of the ruling regime it was amazing never before in our history once a model code of conduct is implemented never before in our history have the leaders escaped if prime minister modi made the most horrendous communal speech in banswara and rajasthan outright communal speech what does the election commission do it does not point out that it is modi who has made the speech they give some general notice to the bhartiya janata party to prevent their leaders from making hate speeches never before in history it is always the individual who is held accountable during the course of the election campaign apart from the election commission we know the huge amounts of money 8500 crore rupees on electoral bonds 
and counting because there was so much more money which was received through a most corrupt avenue of quid pro quo or extortion. So the election commission, the money, the use of central agencies to intimidate, bully, split the opposition, to buy out people, to threaten people, never before have two chief ministers been arrested on the eve of elections, never before. And therefore, you go into an election in a tilted for dictatorship position where there is no living playing field, you fight the elections with the support of the people of India, you ensure the defeat of the one-party majority of the BJP, and that is why I call it a moral victory for the India platform and all the opposition parties and a defeat for the one-party rule of the BJP. However, in this context, I must point out that I have seen several commentaries in which the celebrations of um, the defeat of the 400 plus uh, slogan are leading to a sort of an I would say, exaggerated assessment that this is the end of one party dictatorship or this is the end of the dictator and now Modi will have to bow before the allies and so on. I mean, there is a shift, there's no doubt about it. As I have said, it's a severe, it's a setback. But we should not on any count underestimate the deep roots of this tilt towards hybrid dictatorship, which is based on a Hindutva platform, which is a highly communal platform, which is not limited just by an assessment of votes. We would be very mistaken if we did that. Because what we are seeing is whereas the BJP suffered huge defeats in North India, in many states of North India, including the heartland of Hindutva, Uttar Pradesh, the heartland of Uttar Pradesh, Ayodhya, the symbol of the Ram Mandir narration as one of the biggest platforms, electoral platforms used by the BJP to rouse communal feelings against minorities and against what they call the quote-unquote anti-Ram, anti-Sanatani Dharam forces, meaning the opposition. All that was defeated. That's good. But there has been an increase, an expansion of the BJP in many states, including South Indian states, including Kerala, where there has been an increase across of an average, in some seats much more, but on an average 3% votes. Here in Trishur, the people of Trishur have elected for the first time in Kerala's history, a member of parliament belonging to the BJP who is now a member of the government. He may not be happy because he may have expected something else, but the question is that we cannot underestimate the power of that ideology which exists in India today. And the challenges, I believe, that face us, the way the BJP will try and utilize its position of power to reverse the reality of not having a one-party majority are things which are in the future, but remembering the past is being able to decipher the future. Understanding the past and the present is a way to anticipate the future, to understand the challenges. And therefore, I think it would be extremely, uh, I would say, uh, illusory for us if we thought that the battle is even half over. No, it is not. Not at all. But yes, the people of India have spoken and they have provided a democratic space for us 
to go forward. And I would also just like to mention, in Orissa, with the sweep that the BJP has established, I don't know whether we are aware that the person chosen as the Chief Minister of Orissa, a long-time RSS tribal leader, a strong RSS, staunch RSS tribal leader, just two years ago, he was sitting on Dharna along with the Bajrang Dal people and the Hindutva Sangh Parivar people demanding the release of Dara Singh who was convicted for the brutal murder of Graham Steins and his two children. You remember Graham Steins, the missionary who worked among the tribals of Orissa, who was brutally burned to death along with his two children, minor boys. And the present tribal chief minister was sitting on Dharna demanding his release. This is the kind of challenge that we face. I don't know. The Gujarat government did release the killers and the rapists in the Bilkis Banu case. I don't know if that is the kind of situation we are now going to face in Orissa with the chief minister having actually sat on Dharna demanding the release of Dara Singh. We don't know whether that will lead to another Bilkis Banu case in the Graham Steins case in Orissa. But I give you this example just to point out that it is a much deeper challenge that we face. And with the help of the people of India, because we have seen the importance of the Kisan struggles in this entire development of creating a democratic space. It was in all the centers of Kisan struggle, in Rajasthan, in Punjab, in Haryana, in West UP, in Maharashtra, where the BJP lost 38 seats. This is a remarkable transformation, a transfer of struggle on people's issues, on struggle for people's rights, on struggles for justice. It's a remarkable transfer of that struggle into a political message to punish those responsible for the repression against the Kisans. So these are some of the lessons that we learn in the struggle for democracy in India. But the question today before us in this discussion is, what makes democracy so vulnerable to the forces of dictatorship. Why should it happen that a country like India, an independent country which has fought for its freedom, what is it that makes our democracy so vulnerable to these kind of assaults? And for this, I think, I would like to elaborate on three concepts developed by Comrade EMS and other Marxist thinkers, and also Dr. Baba Saab Ambedkar. The first concept is the concept of economic democracy. We have been talking about forms of governance as being democratic. No. That is only one aspect of democracy. But what does democracy mean for the mass of people in any country which has a parliamentary system of, of governance? EMS said, political democracy, we call it political democracy. Political democracy without economic democracy is an empty shell. 
It is only when the masses of our people get freedom from economic exploitation that democracy will become truly meaningful. Now, of course, Emes was talking about a different time. He was critiquing bourgeois democracy. He was saying this is a form of bourgeois democracy because actual democracy does not exist in an unequal, economically unequal, exploitative uh, capitalist society. So it was in a different context. But for our purpose, the shell is exactly the shell of a hollowed out democracy in today's context. And as I had mentioned earlier, the question of inequality, a very interesting analysis by, I read it in the Financial Review magazine by an analyst called Debashish Chakravarti. I'm not going into all the details, I have them for anybody who wants them. But what he shows is that as dictatorial trends developed in political democracy, in the economic sphere, we found the growth of the centralization of economic power in the hands of certain big business houses. And he has identified the five big business houses, which are, um, obviously, uh, we all know their names, Ambani, Reliance's Ambani, Tata's, Aditya Birla, Adani, and Bharati Telecom. And what he is showing is that the support of corporate India for the project of depleting democracy was a very clear indication of the class nature of the tilt towards dictatorship, hybrid dictatorship in India. And this is very closely linked, my dear friends, to the concept of economic democracy in the struggle against authoritarianism and dictatorship. And it is this concentration of power which represents, I would say, an alliance. Of course, we always say the ruling classes are represented by the representatives of the ruling classes in ruling class political parties. But here we find something similar as to what happened in Hitler's Germany. And we have seen through the course of history, and even now in many of the right-wing regimes across the world, how big corporates are the strongest pillars in the support for despots and for attacks on democracy. So the concept of economic democracy, which is a concept for the rights of the working people to the fruits of their labor, is a very critical concept in our fight and in our understanding of democracy versus dictatorship. Very often, many parties who are secular, democratic, who fight against the BJP, they, in their entire analysis, what is absent is the class nature of this tilt towards dictatorship. And I think that is what EMS's concept of economic democracy is very critical and it should translate in the coming days to wider struggles against neoliberal policies, against the sellout of India, for Kisan and Mazur issues, for the rights of women, the youth, unemployment, all the issues which we raise. Remember, it is part of the fight for economic democracy. The second concept which I flagged today is that of social democracy, which was understood, analyzed, and raised by Dr. Baba Saab Ambedkar. And what he said is very interesting. Political democracy cannot last unless there lies at the base of its social democracy. Social democracy means a way of life which recognizes liberty, equality, and fraternity as the principles of life. Democracy without social justice is a formality and a sham. 
and of course ambedkar was referring to the most resilient reactionary system in indian society which is the caste system and we have seen how the caste system has to a great extent through manavadi cultures and ideologies push the hindutva agenda it is a matter of great comfort and pride and inspiration that across many states of india the dalits linked their own fight against dictatorial tendencies and agencies to the fight to save the constitution of india that's a very important development the fight against the caste system the fight against patriarchy the fight against social inequalities embedded in our systems it's not just something superstructural as part of our culture it is embedded even in the way capitalism develops in india it has become systemic and how can you talk, think about democracy and the fight against dictatorship unless we fight for what ambedkar called liberty equality fraternity against the caste system and the annihilation of the caste system in this i just want to mention something which always bugs me many of our friends our intellectual friends when they look at the caste system and they look at elections and they look at the way this caste is being allied with this caste through seat representation given by different parties they have coined a phrase called micro social engineering what is this micro social there's no such this don't approve of a cynical strategy which actually manipulates caste it is a manipulation of caste this caste with that caste and the bjp has become master of the art but don't forget it is not to annihilate the caste system it is to use the caste system it is to build different caste alliances within the toxic caste framework of india and therefore to reach social democracy we must we must fight against social inequalities is one of the most intrinsic parts of our fight the third and final concept is linked to the first two and this is to examine the cultural world and how cultures are developed for example nationalism the way nationalism is now defined linked to hindutva linked to hindu identities demonizing all non hindus all minorities and particularly the muslim minorities being anti national these cultures which develop through different political agendas sometimes we ignore this aspect and we just think in terms of this vote and that vote whereas the battle really is for people's minds people's minds we can reach people's hearts but to reach people's minds we need to engage understand resist fight ideologically and this is where our youth and students our young people this is where that great challenge lies this is where our energies must be pooled together to be able to challenge the cultural world where we think and that is why ambedkar said democracy in india is only the top soil because underneath the top soil there is deep inequality in cultures which promote inequality we are being punished for being poor because of a sin we have created in our previous lives or oh, this is our station in life we must accept to be indian means to be tolerant to be acceptance tolerant and acceptance yes 
but not of the wrong values of hatred, subordination, and domination. So this is the ideological battle. So when we talk about the fight and the balance between dictatorship and democracy, I really challenge this whole concept of India being, quote unquote, the mother of democracy. Because we have seen through various times of our history the very cruel rule of unequal societies, communities, caste, gender. And if we look at economic and social democracy as part of democracy and not just the form of governance, then we have to question ourselves and to pledge to take forward the space that the people of India have provided in the setback to the forces of authoritarianism and communalism and to take our struggle forward. We have to regather, remobilize, and come together with a renewed strength to take our struggle for democracy forward. I thank you very much. And once again, I pay my tribute to Comedy M.S. Nambudipa. Thank you.